about the noise and some experience from Sweden and EU. This webinar is taking place uh, within the project on, uh, for development of strategy and action plan for environment. Within this project, for the first time in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the environmental topics uh, will be discussed in parallel uh, across the levels of government and uh, we will be preparing strategy and action plan for Bosnia and Herzegovina Federation, Republika Srpska and the Pechko district. And another important point about this topic is that uh, this is the first time that uh, we have strategic approach to the noise within the environmental strategy. This uh, project started in September 2019 and it will end uh, in April 2020, 2022, too, I apologize. The project uh, so uses a participatory approach both experts and stakeholders from the institutions, non-governmental sector, business sector, and the research sector directly contribute uh, to and participate in the development of the strategy and uh, action plan, which covers different topics. These topics include water, waste, biodiversity and nature conservation, air quality and climate change and energy, chemical safety and noise, sustainable resources management and environmental management. Today's webinar will, is the part of the responsibility of the working group for chemical safety and noise. I'm Melina Jajcvaljevac. I am the lead expert for chemical safety and noise. And together with me, my colleague Borislav Malinovic is moderating this group and he will present the current situation in this area. After Borislav, we will have some very interesting uh, presentation by Lisa Johansson from Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, Charlotte Eriksson from the Karlovska Institute uh, in Sweden. And then we will hear a presentation from Viktor Minchovic from Romania. You will hear more about them in the continuation. Let me just uh, mentioned that you can also ask questions during this webinar and we will answer your questions uh, during the Q&A session. You can use the Q&A box uh, to send your questions and uh, I encourage you that uh, you ask questions during the presentation and the presenters will answer your questions during the Q&A sessions. Now, may I invite my colleague uh, Malinovic to present the current situation uh, on in environmental noise in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you, Melina. Good morning to all participants in today's webinar. I am Borisov Malinovic, and together with Melina, I am moderating today's webinar and uh, within the ESAP project 2030 plus, uh, I moderate with her the working group uh, for chemical safety and noise. I am a visiting professor of the technological faculty uh, at the university in Banja Luka, and I will provide just a brief introduction in today's topic and provide a summary of the situation in the area of noise in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Melina, can you confirm that uh, I shared my screen? Thank you. As we already said, we are working uh, within the working group, uh, the chemical safety and noise. 
and we cover two topics. One of them is noise. Our topic is uh, the environmental noise. And uh, I would like to read the definition of uh, the environmental noise uh, under the EU directive, where the noise is defined as unwanted and uh, uh, no, uh, sound uh, harmful for human health, including the noise coming from railways, uh, industrial plants and roads. This uh, directive does not uh, uh, cover the noise from residential areas and self-reported uh, noise or noise uh, uh, from military or from workplaces. This directive of the EU requires necessary measures. That's the noise mapping, uh, inclusion or involvement of the public and development of action plans. On the right hand side, you can see a screenshot from the uh, environmental agency of uh, the EU, uh, which was comprised from multiple maps from EU countries. As for the current situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we cover all four jurisdictions, Bosnia and Herzegovina, both entities and the Bačko district. At the BIH level, the responsibilities uh, are assigned only in the area of transport, and that is covered by the Ministry of Transport of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Ministry of Foreign Trade, uh, and uh, the Directorate for Railways uh, and uh, Air Traffic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. There is a number of uh, laws in place and regulations, and this is covered quite well. However, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we don't have any uh, action plan or maps of the noise. As for the Federation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the situation is slightly better because we have the law on noise protection in place, but this is the only regulation that uh, covers uh, the noise, and uh, but it is not a good uh, basis for transposition of directives. The law envisages uh, the development uh, of uh, environmental impact studies, but there is uh, no activities on development of noise maps at the level of the cantons or the federation. The situation is uh, in the Publica Srpska is slightly worse. Uh, the noise uh, is regulated uh, by the law on uh, environmental protection. There are some elements in this law, however, the uh, there is a rule book in place, uh, which was uh, passed in 89. The law does not envisage development of maps of noise or action plans uh, for noise management, and therefore there is no information on activities in this area. The situation in the Bačko district is similar to the situation in Republika Srpska. The law on environmental protection contains several provisions that pertain to the noise. However, uh, uh, as for the uh, noise emission, they apply the regulation on uh, uh, permitted uh, uh, intensity of noise uh, uh, and uh, sounds in from 1989. Let me just uh, reflect uh, on the previous activities of our working groups. We have held two meetings so far uh, across the levels, so in eight meetings in total, within our strategic goal, which was defined at the beginning of the project, and that's the protection of human health and improvement of welfare and quality of life for all. We identified uh, some 
key challenges, challenges which are more or less similar across the levels, and that's the lack of an adequate uh, legal framework uh, which regulates EU acquis, dispersion and insufficient clear institutional responsibilities with regard to the noise management, environmental noise management, low level of uh, knowledge of public uh, officials and the public uh, on the effects of the noise and lack of strategic planning. Then we also uh, identified some objectives, that's the development of the legal framework, then uh, setting up of coordination mechanism and clear institutional responsibilities with regard to the implementation of the EU acquis, improved strategic planning, improved knowledge of public on noise management, environmental noise management, and improved capacities of public uh, officials and the public. This is the result of our work so far. And uh, for all the participants of today's webinar, uh, uh, I suppose we have other participants than the members of the working group. But I encourage all of you to uh, make an effort to contribute to the development of ESAP through e-consultations. You can find more information on our website, www. Uh, ESAP ba, uh, BA, uh, what you need to do is to uh, open our website, register, and then you will be receiving uh, uh, information on a regular basis, and you will be able to participate in the development of the environmental strategy and action plan. You can also find uh, information on our Facebook page, BIH ESAP. And that would be all from my side. Melina, back to you. Thank you, Borislav. This was a very good introduction. Let me also share with you that the, this webinar was organized in order to enhance the knowledge of the participants of the working group uh, for further work and for the next meeting which will take place uh, late this month and before we start with the next presentation uh, which will be uh, presented by Lisa Johansson you can also use the language option. Uh, you have been provided uh, with this information in the invitation, but uh, let me remind you that you can use the icon, the globe on the bottom of the screen where you can select uh, either BIH or English language option so you can uh, listen in your own language. Now I would like to introduce Lisa Johansson uh, from the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, you can see her CV. Uh, she has previously worked as an acoustic consultant and has experience of noise measurements, noise mapping, and noise abatement progress from road, rail, aircraft, and industrial noise. Now, Lisa, you have the floor. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Uh, good. Um, in this uh, presentation, I will start with summarizing how noise is regulated in the EU. This will be a rather short summary. Uh, and later today, I will go into more detail, specifically concerning the Environmental Noise Directive, which is one of the major parts of the EU noise key. You can change slide there, please. Um, I think if you go back one slide. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, my name is Lisa Johansson and I work at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency as a scientific officer. I work with mainly two areas, which is noise in general and also with guidelines and environmental permit processes for airports and harbors. 
My background is that I am an acoustician. Uh, I have a licentiate degree in acoustics and I worked for about 15 years as a consultant uh, with mostly environmental noise project. As such, I had a small part in the first round of noise mapping according to the END uh, in, of Stockholm, which turned out to be a very difficult project. Uh, we hadn't done that kind of project before and we underestimated the time and effort it took to uh, finalize that project. So it took much longer than expected and actually became a substantial financial loss for the company I worked with. But on the upside, we also learned a lot. Uh, and I have later worked with other cities uh, that are about to do noise mapping uh, and also with action plans and other noise abatement programs. We can change slide there, please. Noise regulations in the EU is divided in two parts. Uh, first, there is a collection of regulations concerning the noise sources, like road vehicles and aircrafts. And then there is the Environmental Noise Directive, or the END, which states that all large cities, roads, railroads and airports should report how many people are exposed to noise to the EU every five years. And they should also produce an action plan every five years to show how they plan to reduce the numbers of exposed to noise. And as I said, I will go into more detail about the END later today. As for the regulations, um, they are, as I said, uh, spe specifying noise emission regulations for road vehicles, aircrafts, railroad and other outdoor equipments. And you can change the slide, please. For the regulations on road vehicles, there are a few to consider. Uh, these states limit values for the noise emission for different kinds of vehicles, both uh, trucks, uh, motorcycles, normal cars, etc. And there is also specific regulations concerning tire noise, uh, since one of the major sound sources for traffic noise is the connection between the road surface and the tire. And you might have seen the classification uh, in the image to the right uh, for tires, where it is specified how the tire performs in terms of fuel consumption, grip on wet surfaces, and also noise. And these kinds of classifications are meant to make it easier for the consumers to do an informed choice when buying new tires. Next slide. For railroads, there are also several regulations that in different ways concern noise. I will not go into every detail uh, of these, but one of the bigger questions that have been discussed in the EU these latest few years is a ban on railway brakes of caster iron on freight trains. Changing the brakes to composite materials would significantly reduce the noise emitted from the trains. Uh, but it has also been shown that composite brakes, the, the quieter ones that they want to change to, are not as safe as caster iron brakes in very cold temperatures. And since railway carts are meant to travel all across Europe, and they are very much international and travel across the country borders, they must work both in the warmth of southern Spain, for example, and in the cold northern Finland. And this is a typical example where you have to weigh the environmental factors against what could possibly be an obstacle for the free trade in the EU. Next slide. For aircraft noise, there is also limits concerning noise emission. Older aircrafts with high noise emission, so-called chapter three aircrafts, are banned from many uh, European airports. And the regulation of aircrafts is in many ways international with the international organ ICAO responsible for most of the policies concerning traffic safety and environment from aircraft. There is also the European organ EASA working with similar, similar questions. The member states in EASA is the EU and a few others like Norway. And Bosnia and Herzegovina is one of the pan-European partners to EASA and is as such cooperating with EASA in some of the agreements, but they are not uh, as of today a full member. And you can change slide. 
And finally, there is a European directive concerning noise emissions from equipment used outdoors. And this directive is targeting a broad range of equipment. And as you can see from the examples in the pictures, uh, it is everything from large machines and vehicles used for groundworks and contracting down to small uh, privately owned lawn movers. And this directive includes both limit values for noise emission for certain uh, equipment and also methods, standardized methods for noise measurements for that can use for can be used for many kinds of equipment. So it's a very broadly targeting uh, directive. And next slide. Uh, and Apart from the noise emission, there is also the environmental noise directive that targets the exposure rather than the emission from noise sources. And in short, the END says that large cities, railroads, airports, and roads should calculate noise maps and the number of inhabitants exposed to noise every five years and report this to the EU. And they should use standardized methods to do these calculations. And then they should also make an action plan every five years on how to reduce noise and how to reduce the numbers of exposed. And that action plan should also be reported to the EU every five years. And as I said, I will later today go into detail on how to work with the END and what steps needs to be taken to fulfill the, the requirements of the END. Uh, so I will not uh, go into more detail about that now. Uh, so this, this part was the short summary of the EU regulations in general. And then after we have heard Charlotte, uh, I will return to talk more about the END. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Now we are about to hear presentation by Charlotte Eriksson, Karolinska Institute. Let's see her biography briefly as well. So Dr. Charlotte Eriksson is an environmental epidemiologist at the Center for Occupational Environmental Medicine in Stockholm, and she's a researcher at the Institute of Environmental Medicine, Karolinska Institute. Her main area of research is health effects of community noise exposure, in particular uh, cardiovascular and metabolic outcomes. She frequently participates in health risk assessments regarding community noise on regional, national, and international levels. Charlotte, please take the floor. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Charlotte Eriksson, and I would like to thank you for this opportunity to present on the impact of noise on human health. Next slide, please. So as we've heard, uh, the definition of uh, community noise, according to the END, the Environmental Noise Directive, is that it is unwanted or harmful outdoor sound created by human activity. For instance, noise emitted at different means of transport, road, railway, aircraft traffic, and also industrial noise or activities. But there are, of course, many other sources around us. Uh, for instance, uh, construction work, noise from neighbors, restaurants, bars, uh, waste management and more. So the, the picture is rather complex when it comes to uh, noise exposure in general. Next slide, please. Community noise is also an increasing problem and it is actually one of our most common environmental problems. And it's also a problem that continues to increase. We have in Sweden, we now have 85% of the population living in urbanized areas. And we also have an increase of traffic or transports and the densification and building of new homes in really noise polluted areas. Next, please. It has been estimated that approximately 20% uh, of the European population live in areas where the traffic noise levels can be harmful to human health, around 55 dB. 
And the major source is road traffic, followed by railway noise, aircraft noise, and also industrial noise. But this is likely to be an underestimation since the European Environmental Noise Directive does not cover all areas of, of the EU. Next, please. So in, the, in 2018, the WHO came out with new uh, environmental noise guidelines with the aim to provide recommendations for protecting human health from exposure to environmental noise originating from various sources. And this uh, regulation was based on several systematic reviews and meta-analysis on critical health effects of noise. And you can see the link to the document here in my slide. Next, please. Uh, so there are many different health effects um, from following noise exposure. At very high noise levels, uh, it may cause difficulties for the hearing organ and cause hear hearing loss and even tinnitus. But this is mostly common in, in occupational settings. So when it comes to more moderate noise levels from community noise, we have a number of other responses. For instance, a general annoyance response, uh, difficulties in communication and speech perception, uh, loss of concentration, and also effects on cognitive functioning. Uh, noise exposed populations also often experience sleep disturbances and may uh, be found in a state of chronic stress, which in turn may enhance the risk for several cardiovascular and metabolic diseases, for instance, hypertension, uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, and obesity. So I would like to go through the evidence on some of these uh, health outcomes here for you now. Next, please. Uh, noise annoyance is the most common effect in noise exposed populations. It is a, a subjective experience of discomfort and irritation arising from unavoidable sounds. And usually it's measured by self-report, uh, the percentage of highly annoyed in a population, denoted percent HA, highly annoyed. And the degree of annoyance depends on a large number of factors. Uh, it is closely related, of course, to the characteristics of the sound, the volume, the frequency, the duration, and the temporality, to mention some. Next, please. Um, the annoyance response also depends on the situation you're in, uh, what time of day it is, and what type of activity you're engaging yourself in, uh, like sleeping, resting, or reading, or some more act activity. Uh, it also depends on who you are, your personal factors, age and mental and physical health, your attitudes towards the noise source, and also coping mechanisms. That is your possibilities to avoid the noise. Next, please. So on a population level, we can see clear exposure response patterns uh, between noise levels and the proportion uh, of highly annoyed in the population. So WHO has defined 10% highly annoyed as a called so-called critical effect. And this is reached at about uh, 53 dB LDEN for road traffic. For 54 for railway traffic and already at 45 dB and then for aircraft traffic. Next, please. So it seems uh, that aircraft noise at any given level is the most disturbing of these traffic noise sources. This figure shows an example from Stockholm data uh, where you can clearly see that the annoyance response is much higher for aircraft than for road traffic and railway noise. Uh, but of course, the annoyance response in a population is of also regulated or moderated by several uh, factors. For example, we saw effects of building type, uh, of the construction year of the building, if you have an access to quiet side or not, and whether or not the building was soundproofed. Next, please. This is again an example from our uh, Stockholm population where we saw uh, an increased risk for reduced communication and spe speech perception as a function of the road traffic noise. So here we can see an increased uh, uh, reporting of communication problems relating to the 
outdoor noise level at your home. And this uh, was significant associations for both road, railway and aircraft noise. So a clear exposure response uh, association for all traffic noise sources with communication difficulties. Next, please. Uh, noise may also interfere with our cognitive functions, with performance and also with learning. And this is especially true when we have complex tasks uh, with high demands on speech perception, concentration and also memory. And potential mechanisms for this is that uh, sound may mask information and lead to lower speech perception. Uh, but noise may also distract our attention uh, increase stress levels and lead to tiredness and exhaustion. Next, please. Yes. Uh, so children are seen as a particular vulnerable group when it comes to cognitive effects of noise. And children are still evolving both mentally and physically, and their cognitive processes are not completely developed. So they're uh, therefore more easily distracted by sounds in their environment. And studies on traffic noise and cognitive functioning in children show, for example, effects on reading comprehension, um, deteriorated standardized tests, uh, worsened memory functioning, and also effects on children's motivation to finish tasks. So a sort of learned helplessness. The so-called branch study is the um, today largest study available on cognitive effects of children in children of noise. So it involved approximately 2000 children in the ages nine to 10 years, uh, going to schools around three major European airports. It was Schiphol in Amsterdam, Barajas in um, Madrid, and also Heathrow, London. And it, in this particular study, they found associations between aircraft noise and impaired reading comprehension, episodic memory, working memory and also sustained attention. But there were no associations with, uh, with road traffic here. Next, please. Uh, turning to sleep disturbances. Sleep is a necessity for both physical and mental health. It is an important uh, outcome per se, but it's also important as a mediator to more serious illness. For example, sleep uh, problems have been associated with cardiovascular diseases, uh, obesity, and also depression. Uh, sleep can be measured both objectively through, for example, polysomnography, EEG activity and muscle tonus, or subjectively through self-report self of high sleep disturbance. This figure shows uh, the normal sleep structure, a stable sleep structure over the night of approximately eight hours. It shows different sleep stages uh, from quite deep sleep in the beginning of the night to more uh, lighter sleep, REM sleep or dream sleep in the end of the night. And especially the deep sleep, the short wave sleep is important for restoration and memory consolidation. Next, please. So this is what happens when we have a night with disturbed sleep, noise disturbed sleep. So we have a reduced total sleep time due to, for example, insomnia, awakenings during the night and also early awakenings in the morning. So what happens is that we have a fragmented sleep pattern with shorter periods of coherent shortwave sleep and REM sleep. We also have cardiovascular arousals, for example, increases in blood pressure and heart rate and an increased level of stress hormones, for example, cortisol. And this is possible since the auditory system is, is always uh, open uh, for impressions, even when we sleep. Next, please. Yes. So this shows you that there is an association between uh, noise levels within the bedroom and the probability of sleep stage changes or awakenings uh, due to uh, road traffic, aircraft and railway noise. So you can see that the more noise we have in our bedroom, 
the greater is the risk of uh, going into lighter sleep stages or even to um, a state of awake. Next. Uh, there are also on a population level clear exposure, exposure associations between uh, noise levels outdoor in the residential areas and the percentage in the population reporting being highly sleep disturbed. And again, we can see here that aircraft noise seems to be more disturbing than road traffic and railway noise at any particular uh, noise level. When it comes to the cardiovascular and metabolic um, effects of uh, community noise, there are several potential biological mechanisms present here. So in the acute phase, uh, noise may actually cause a stress response through the activation of our sympathetic nervous system and also the endocrine system. So what happens is that we have hemodynamic and metabolic and immunological effects of this noise exposure. For example, we have an increase in stroke volume and heart rate, vasoconstriction, uh, which increases blood pressure, and also release of free fatty acids and mobilization of glucose, to mention a few. And in the long run, uh, noise exposure may lead both to annoyance and sleep disturbances, as we talked about, but also may cause a dysregulation of the stress mechanism. And this would lead to an increased risk of several cardiovascular diseases, for instance, then hypertension, myocardial infarction and stroke. And also during recent years, it's been speculating that noise may actually also cause metabolic outcomes in terms of increased risk of obesity, glucose regulation and type 2 diabetes. Next, please. So this is just to show you where we are, are at uh, with regards to state of research at the moment. And this is based on the WHO um, literature reviews and meta-analysis. So for the evidence on hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, these studies have mainly focused on road traffic noise. So there are at the time, at 2015, uh, 26 cross-sectional studies showing an increased risk of about 5% uh, per 10 decibel increase uh, in noise level. But there were uh, only one present cohort study, which is longitudinal. Um, so this is a limitation. And the WHO actually graded the evidence as low quality due to the fact that we had studies of rather low quality, the cross-sectional rather than the longitudinal design. Next, please. However, with regards to ischemic heart disease, uh, such as myocardial infarction, the evidence is rated as high quality. And this is because there are several longitudinal studies which have followed up people up in time for a quite long time and see that noise is actually associated with an increased risk of incident ischemic heart disease. And this evidence is the strongest for uh, road traffic noise with a relative risk of 1.08, uh, which means that we have an 8% increase in risk per 10 dB uh, noise level. And it is statistically significant. Next slide. And this uh, shows the exposure response association. And as you can see, the risk of ischemic heart disease seems to increase with increasing noise level, uh, starting from approximately 50, somewhere 55 dB L10. Next. Uh, the evidence on outcomes such as stroke, obesity, and diabetes, diabetes is more scarce. We have fewer studies, and they are mainly of cross-sectional design, which limits then our um, possibilities to infer causality. Uh, but we do have some studies indicating associations and as we've talked about, we have also clear biological mechanisms underlying these associations, which warrants then continuous research. Uh, but overall, uh, the WHO graded the evidence as low quality, mainly because of a lack of studies. Next. 
So just to finish off, uh, a few words about the noise abatement strategies, which we will hear more also from Visa in a short while. Uh, in Sweden, we follow the European Environment Noise Directive, since we are a member state of the EU. And this is the main instrument to identify noise pollution levels and to trigger necessary actions. And these uh, are recurrent processes uh, re recurring in cycles of five years with noise mappings and also noise action planning. And we're now also turning to uh, development of uh, common noise exposure assessment methods to be able to compare data more across uh, Europe. Next. So these are just some examples on how you can tackle noise issues and how you can actually reduce noise exposure in populations and prevent the noise exposure uh, effects on health in the population. So to start with, uh, to adhere to the WHO noise guidelines and also to the national guidelines is of uh, crucial importance. Uh, you must also take noise into account uh, early on in the planning process to prevent the uh, harmful effects. For example, you have to be careful with placement of new residential areas, schools, roads, rail railways and airports, etc. Uh, you should also turn to building construction and promote uh, the building or construction of quiet courtyards. Um, make sure the insulation of buildings is, is adequate and also take into account the bedroom positioning in the buildings during the night so that people can sleep well. Uh, you can also uh, tend to um, the traffic situation as, 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 as such. Uh, for example, traffic can be routed outside the city center, at least the heavy traffic. Or even if you have the possibility, you can uh, lead the traffic below ground in tunnels. Uh, you can work on speed limits, lower speed, it really, it really reduces noise. Um, implementation of electric cars can uh, lead to at least at low noise, uh, lower speeds uh, reduce the noise. Uh, you can work with low noise tires, as mentioned, there are regulations in the EU for this. Um, you can have quiet asphalt. We have worked a lot of this uh, with this in Sweden to try to um, produce asphalt, which is low uh, noise emissions. Uh, you can also work with the local noise screens and other technical solutions in existing buildings, such as uh, changing windows or ventilations to more uh, sound reduce, reduction uh, variants. And finally, you as an individual can also have different coping mechanisms to uh, cope with the noise. For example, use of earplugs or keeping your windows closed. So this is just a battery of examples of what you, how you can work with reducing harmful effects of noise in your population. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you and show this, I think, beautiful uh, green noise screen, which not only reduces noise, but also promotes biological diversity. So many thanks. Thank you indeed for this excellent presentation. It was very interesting for me. The environmental issues become serious one, once you learn about the effects on human health. For me, it was very interesting to hear about the effects on children in development and i believe that was the same for other participants I, I was not aware of this information and thank you very much for this very detailed and interesting information which relies on the outcome of studies uh, of uh, large-scale studies uh, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, confirmed uh, which were confirmed by the world health organization you finished early in then is envisaged a couple of minutes earlier. Now, according to our agenda, we have uh, a short break and uh, we will take 15 minutes break and uh, we'll reconvene at 10 o'clock. Then 
We will continue with the presentation from Mr. Viktor Mitrovic uh, from Romania. So see you after the break. We will resume with uh, our webinar, and I hope that uh, the technical issues uh, some participants had uh, have been resolved. Uh, let me inform you that uh, we currently have uh, 95 participants. We are very happy to have such a large number of participants. And today you've heard some points about the EU acquis, which have certain requirements uh, regarding the noise management, the community noise, noise management. And you've also heard something about the effects of the noise on human health. Now we'll hear about the implementation of EU regulations in the noise management uh, we the, we will have uh, Viktor Minkovic from Romania you can see his CV short CV Mr Minkovic is an advisor at the Romanian Ministry of Environment where he has been working for 16 years in the field of noise assessment and management his activities also include drafting and promoting legislation in the field of noise, ensuring transposition and monitoring the implementation of the END di directive in Romania, participating in working groups organized in the field of noise by the EU Commission and the European Environment Agency. And tax. he was a tax expert mission in the community, Turkish community on Cyprus. Now, Victor, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. You hear me? Okay, thank you. Tremo, Tremo is all ten. Okay. Yes, we you. can hear you well. Uh, my name is uh, Victor Minkevich. I work in the uh, Ministry of Environment, Water and uh, Forest from Romania. And uh, my field of activity is uh, noise. Uh, I am glad to be here with you, and because yesterday was the International Day for Women, I want to wish to women which are present at this meeting a beautiful spring and a lot of happiness. I would also like to express my gratitude to, to the organizers for the opportunity to they offer me to be here with you. And uh, today I will present uh, the uh, Romanian example uh, in uh, approaching the environmental uh, noise. Uh, in the uh, regarding the situation of noise in Romania before um, uh, EU accession, uh, before we become become a member uh, member of uh, European Union, I can tell you that uh, uh, was uh, put before 2007 uh, we, uh, was, which was the year when Romania became the member state in Romania the noise was assessed only using measurements uh, at the level of, of our uh, uh, polytechnic uh, university of Bucharest uh, together together with uh, Bucharest city hall in uh, 17th uh, was made some noise maps in Bucharest but only using measurements 
Uh, generally, the noise measurements in this uh, city, in, the, in these cities, in the past was made by the city call together with uh, with the research institute from a, a communist uh, period. Uh, regarding the legislation in that period, there was available the some legislation regarding hygiene and public health rules on the living environment of the population uh, and these uh, rules provide uh, provided uh, also some uh, rules for noise uh, there was also a national standard uh, at that time which provide uh, limit values for noise in urban areas this uh, national standard uh, exist uh, also now, but in uh, the updated uh, version. Uh, in uh, the 2004-2007 period uh, was the period of pre-accession of EU of Romania. In that period, we uh, uh, ensured the first implement over uh, the first transposition of end in our legislation uh, and uh, of course because uh, we didn't was a member state this uh, transposition was not a full transposition uh, slide two please thank you after the uh, transposition of end uh, which was made the first time in uh, 2005 uh, in the first year of our presence in the European Union in 2007, Romania needs to make uh, strategic noise maps for nine agglomerations, one, uh, one major airport around uh, 250,000 kilometers of major rounds, major routes, and around uh, 67,000 uh, kilometers of major railway. Uh, that, that this task was very, very hard for us because it was the first year uh, where Romania was a member state of the European Union, and uh, we didn't were well prepared for this uh, in terms of uh, technical uh, preparation of noise mapping. Uh, in this uh, government decision for uh, 2005, which assured the first transposition of end in our legislation, the responsibility, uh, the out, the responsible authorities were generally defined, but as as well as uh, agglomeration, main road, major airport, and major railways, uh, uh, but they were not identified by name, being provided in the legislation only only the criteria for identifying identifying them. For this reason, it was very hard for our authorities to fulfill uh, this task in good condition uh, in 2007. In order to improve this situation, uh, in 2007, we make uh, the first um, modification of our governmental decision, uh, which uh, assured the transposition of end in our national legislation. Uh, in order to solve uh, uh, the infringement which Romania received for the European Commission for, for that transposition, and also to, to solve some uh, aspects regarding, to improve some aspects regarding, uh, regarding uh, the responsibility of authorities uh, and also to, to, to identify by name in our legislation all our agglomeration, major roads, major railways, and major airports. Also in 2008-2011 period uh, was uh, developed uh, guidelines for noise mapping, uh, for action planning, and uh, regulation for noise limit. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, this uh, this guidelines not was available in, uh, for the first round of noise mapping and action planning, but only for the second and for the third round of them. Uh, in 2012 and in 2017. Uh, 
uh, in 2012 and in 2016, we also we have also two new governmental decisions which uh, made uh, some modification of our legislation regarding who have the responsibility to make noise map and action plans for some noise sources inside uh, agglomeration. Uh, in, in 2018, Romania received the first infringement for that implementation. We didn't make the action plans in, in, uh, in, in time, but we solved this infringement because the authorities who were late with action planning solved the problem and finalized the action plans. Also in 2009, uh, we make a new legislation, a law, and to rebuild all previous uh, governmental decision and uh, all, uh, sub, sub, uh, all leg our legislation in a uh, noise field. Uh, this law uh, also ensured uh, the transposition of new Gnosis uh, directive, uh, but Gnosis uh, common method for noise mapping. Uh, now uh, we work uh, to modify again uh, the law in order uh, this law in order to ensure the transposition of other uh, new directive uh, regarding those effect relations which replace the annex three of environmental noise directive. Also, this year we need to put in law also some new guidelines regarding noise mapping and action planning. Uh, Next uh, year, we need also to take in consideration uh, to make uh, to, to put in our legislation uh, the requirements of the new reporting mechanism, which is developed now by the European Commission. This uh, new directive is not uh, finalized, but uh, I think uh, this year will be in force. Next uh, slide, please. In Romania uh, and also in the European Union uh, uh, was uh, three rounds of noise mapping and action planning uh, uh, until now. And uh, in this slide, uh, we see the evolution of a number of agglomeration, major roads, major railways, and uh, major airports in Romania for the last uh, three noise mapping uh, rounds. Uh, in the first round, uh, we need to make noise maps only for agglomerations which have more of 250,000 inhabitants and major roads which have more of 6 million vehicles per year and uh, major uh, railways which had more of 60,000 vehicles per year. Per year. But uh, in round two and three, we made uh, noise maps for all agglomerations all major roads and major railways. Now uh, we prepare uh, for uh, the other uh, new nice uh, for the uh, next new uh, new uh, round uh, noise mapping and action planning, uh, which will uh, uh, have deadline in 2022 for noise mapping and 2024 for uh, uh, action planning. Uh, if you see in uh, these slides, in uh, 2007, we have only nine agglomerations, for example, and uh, in, uh, in 2017, we have uh, 20. Uh, this uh, difference is, is uh, uh, because uh, in the first round, we, we made uh, the next map only for agglomeration, which have more of 250,000 inhabitants. And now we made uh, the noise maps for all agglomeration. Next slide, please. In this slide, I present uh, the evolution of uh, authorities which have uh, the responsibility for noise mapping and action planning in last uh, three noise mapping rounds. As you can see, in, in some cases, the responsibility uh, are different in round two from round in, in uh, round one from round two or round three. That because in the first round, the noise maps and action plans was made uh, 
for city calls for all noise uh, sources from agglomeration. This uh, approach was changed in round two when we put uh, the, responsibility, the responsibility for noise mapping and action planning to airport administration for air traffic, which are inside the agglomeration. And also the approach was changed in round three when we put the, the responsibility for noise mapping and action planning to our national railway company for railway traffic inside agglomeration. Uh, next round, we don't have the intention to, to change something. Uh, that means in the next uh, noise mapping round, the authority which will have the responsibility to make noise map and action plans will be the same like in round three. This, uh, this uh, approach was um, uh, to, to, to improve our, uh, our uh, implementation of environmental noise directive. Uh, was uh, because in the first round um, we, we didn't was prepared to make noise map and action plans and authorities which make uh, in first round uh, this job uh, don't have uh, 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 don't have uh, um, in administration of uh, these noise sources. For this reason, it was very hard for them to make uh, some action plans uh, for something which are not in uh, them administration. Uh, for example, in, uh, in, uh, inside the uh, Bucharest agglomeration, we have uh, one airport and uh, we have also uh, uh, railway traffic, but uh, all uh, uh, railways are under uh, uh, our national uh, railway company administration and uh, the airport administration are not under uh, city hall administration and is uh, under uh, Ministry of Transport administration. For this reason, uh, in, um, in uh, 2007, when, when we was the first uh, uh, round of noise mapping and action planning, City Hall uh, made a lot of a lot of activities for noise mapping and action plans for some sources which are not uh, in uh, them administration. And we improved uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, approach uh, for 2000 uh, in the second round and in the third round of uh, of noise mapping. Okay, uh, so next slide, please. In this slide, I present the evolution of uh, who made the noise map and action plans in Romania uh, last uh, three rounds. Uh, if uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, legislation uh, uh, responsibilities to, uh, to different authorities to make this job, but they can make this job using consultants or using uh, some internal uh, uh, speci specialized uh, compartment, uh, like uh, noise office, for example. Uh, only our uh, national road company uh, make noise map and action planning using uh, 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 noise office and uh, other, uh, all other authorities uh, make the noise maps using uh, external uh, consultants. Next slide, please. Also, in Romania, we had in the past some implementation problems. This type of uh, problems, uh, more or less, are common uh, also in other uh, countries uh, from the European Union. Uh, the most important problem are uh, lack of expertise of my city calls, uh, delay to the procurement procedure, a fluctuation of the staff in the city hall between noise mapping rounds. Uh, for example, in 2020, in some uh, uh, city hall, uh, we have some uh, persons which was in charge for noise uh, field activity. And after five years, uh, uh, this person uh, uh, go in the private to, to work and uh, we have other person in charge 
which don't uh, have uh, enough expertise uh, to do uh, for this job. Uh, these type of problems uh, in general are, uh, are common for uh, city halls. We have a good, uh, good, uh, good organization in, uh, in, uh, inside our national road company, national railway company, or, or uh, inside our uh, uh, airport administration, which make uh, nice maps. But uh, with city halls, it's other, uh, it's other uh, type of problems because this flotation of staff and uh, this uh, delay of budget of uh, the procurement procedures are, are, are uh, the main problems in our delays of uh, the nice maps and action plans. Uh, um, uh, these main problems generally uh, lead to delay in the development in the development of strategic noise map action plan or in the de delivery of lower quality of noise map um, uh, because the city calls do not have the necessary deti details to make a request to the consultant or on the quality of these noise maps. Uh, this type of problem can be solved only uh, by, by develop a good cooperation with uh, local authorities to provide them uh, guidelines and information uh, by making them uh, aware of the importance of uh, reducing the noise in agglomeration and localities uh, in the other localities in general. Next slide, please. In future, uh, in Romania, we need to develop uh, new, new guidelines regarding noise mapping and uh, action planning. Also, our authority, uh, which are in charge with noise mapping, need to make the noise maps uh, using the you method now a hard job because uh, for some uh, cases, uh, new input data are needed. For example, for road traffic uh, noise mapping, more types of uh, of uh, vehicles need to be taken into account. And uh, our national road company, for this reason, need to to develop a new database uh, <clears throat> regarding uh, the uh, number of vehicles and type of uh, types of vehicles which are need, need for, uh, for noise mapping. Uh, also, the environmental authorities need to have some tools in order to check if uh, uh, consultants, for example, which make noise maps, use the gnosis EU methods and no other methods. Because uh, like I, I say in the previous slides, uh, um, the uh, staff of uh, the city hall not uh, have uh, a good uh, expertise in uh, noise field and uh, uh, they need to know very exactly how they can check if the consultant uh, make a good uh, uh, quality job and for that we need to to provide some guidelines in order to help them uh, to to fulfill this uh, this uh, job. Also, uh, in action planning uh, for next round, uh, we need to have a correlation of uh, noise reduction measurements with the data provided by the those effect relations from the new one three of the environmental noise director. This type of uh, correlation uh, didn't was uh, in the previous action plan. So this is, is will be a new job for uh, for them. And uh, uh, our uh, estimation is also uh, the city hall will have um, pro problem to 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 put in application this annex three. We need uh, very clear to to show them uh, how. Uh, they need to to to, to fulfill, fulfill this uh, this uh, uh, content of the uh, annex uh, three. 
Also, next noise mapping uh, round, uh, we need uh, to put in uh, accordance uh, the noise maps uh, and uh, the quiet areas with uh, inspired directive requirements. Uh, the inspired directive is a new uh, other uh, European uh, directive which uh, uh, put uh, member states to make available all uh, the environmental uh, data to the public using uh, uh, tools uh, provided by the uh, European Union uh, geoportal. Uh, in order to, to make our noise maps and uh, our uh, quiet areas uh, in, uh, in a format uh, uh, which are uh, compliant with the uh, inspired directive, we need also to, to guide, guide uh, our local authorities, uh, especially, uh, in order to uh, for them to know very clear which information uh, and which type of data they need to provide in order to fulfill uh, also the inspired directive. Uh, also, now uh, we take in consideration in Romania to define some uh, quiet areas in open country. Uh, until now, uh, we have uh, in our legislation uh, an approach regarding the quiet areas in uh, site agglomeration. But uh, regarding the quiet areas uh, in open country, we uh, didn't have until now uh, some approach and uh, we want to in the future uh, modification of our law to have some approach in order to establish some quiet area in open country. All the that are, uh, are uh, new jobs for our authorities and for this reason the next round of uh, noise maps and action plans we estimate uh, will uh, be more difficult to put in application. Uh, next slide, please. In conclusion, uh, implementation of the Environmental Health Directive uh, represents a lot of things which our authorities need to make. Noise maps using NOSSEU method, action plans using, using uh, those effect relations, uh, provide noise maps and quiet areas in uh, inspired format, develop tools in order to make accessible uh, of them uh, by the population using European Union uh, geo portal. All these things are new. Uh, we didn't make the, the, this job in the past in the first uh, three noise mapping rounds. And for this reason, a continuous preparation of the authorities for the noise mapping and action planning is needed and a continuous harmonization of the legislation, taking into consideration the gaps which we detect during the implementation of environment noise directive need to take into consideration in our uh, legislation. Also, in order to prevent uh, the future infringements from the European Union, a uh, continuous uh, follow up of the delays in uh, making noise maps and action plans and uh, uh, speeding uh, up the actions uh, of completion of them is needed. Um, we have this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, we have in 2018 uh, uh, infringement for uh, delays of uh, making our action plans, and uh, we uh, saw how how hard is to 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 solve this uh, this problem in order to close uh, this type of uh, infringements. For all these reasons, uh, our recommendation is uh, that. Uh, uh, the environmental authorities in your country, which will develop the necessary legislation for noise mapping and action planning, and the authorities uh, uh, responsible to make noise mapping and action planning uh, need to collaborate with each 
with each other to solve easier uh, the problems that uh, generally occur in the implementation of environmental noise management with uh, especially without uh, collaboration be be between uh, environmental authorities and the city halls will be very hard to put in application uh, to have a good application of uh, environmental noise directive next slide thank you for your attention Thank you for this excellent presentation. I found it very interesting, particularly taking into account that Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, preparing for joining the European Union. It is quite interesting to hear experiences from Romania starting from 2007 until now, uh, where you have uh, been improving the process of mapping and action plans development in a way it is a very nice example for participants on the working group particularly when incorporating certain measures to have a feeling where we should start from taking into account that our institutional capacities are not at satisfactory level either when it comes to noise management uh, throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I dare to say uh, the public is not sufficiently aware about the noise effect. And now we have finished all presentations that we have planned to uh, uh, here today and now we are in the section for panel discussion melina melina please i have to interrupt you we have another presentation by mrs johansson oh i have not noted this down i apologize borislav thank you for interrupting me we have another part of presentation by miss lisa lisa please take the floor Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I will continue this presentation with going more into detail about the environmental noise directive and what it contains and what kind of work that needs to be done to fulfill uh, what is in the directive. And you can change slide, please. This is the same slide as I ended my first presentation with. Uh, it's a summary of the END and what it contains. That is that you need to do calculations of environmental noise and how many that are exposed to environmental noise and action plans on how to reduce the noise. And you can also see the limits uh, for when the END applies. And as you can see, it's not just the really big cities that are involved, but rather medium-sized cities and above with more than 100,000 inhabitants. And then there are also the major roads and major, major railways and airports uh, that are uh, a part of the END. In 2017, uh, the END covered one, 511 urban areas across the EU territory, uh, 420,000 kilometers of major road, 50,000 kilometers of major rail, railways and 89 major airports. So it's quite a large task that is being done in the EU every five years of uh, mapping these cities and uh, infrastructure. You can change the slide. Before we go into more detail about the END, I want to mention the noise indicators that we are using. Uh, they have been mentioned before today, uh, and I thought we could uh, just define what they, what, they, uh, what they mean. The noise mapping should report the LDEN level, which is the day, evening and night level, and also the night level L night. The LDEN is a year averaged equivalent noise level where the noise level at night has a penalty of 10 dB. And this is because people tend to be more sensitive to noise disturbances at night. And the noise level on evenings also have a penalty, but of only 5 dB. 
And the time intervals for the evening period and the night period can vary between countries, but it's often the ones that I show on these slides. In some countries, they have postponed the evening and the night uh, one hour, but they should always be four hours of evening and eight hours of night. But the night can start at 11 o'clock instead of uh, 10 o'clock. And then there is the night level, which is the equivalent level without any penalties for eight hours of night, often from 10 p.m. Uh, L night is often used also to estimate the risk of sleep disturbances. There are other noise indicators used throughout Europe, like the 24 hour equivalent level without any penalties. And in some cases also the L max is used, which is the maximum noise level during a certain specific period of time. The L max is most commonly used for industrial noise, but also in some cases for uh, estimating uh, sleep disturbances with indoor noise. There are also different ways to calculate or estimate the negative health effects, such as annoyance, sleep disturbance, and risk, increased risk of heart disease. One way to do that is to calculate the cost for society for different kinds of negative health effects. That cost can then be used for a cost-benefit analysis for different noise reduction measures. And in the next round of noise mapping, according to the END, uh, the member states should re also report a cost of the negative health effects uh, for the first time. One other indicator that can be used is dailies. And daily is an abbreviation for disability adjusted life years. And that includes both the life years lost due to premature deaths due to disease, uh, and also life years affected by disease, such as high blood pressure or disability, such as hearing loss. And the Swedish Transport Administration did an estimation of dailies due to noise a few years ago in Sweden and calculated it to be about 40,000 dailies per year. And that includes about 500 premature deaths per year. And that can be correlated to the population in Sweden, which is about 10 million people. Within the EU, it is estimated that noise leads to about 450,000 dailies per year due to high annoyance alone and the same amount for sleep disturbance, and then about 150,000 dailies per year due to ischemic heart disease. So adding these numbers up for the whole EU region, uh, it tends to be quite high figures, showing that noise is uh, in fact a major significant source for negative health. You can change the slide. The Environmental noise direction can, directive can be seen as part of a noise reduction toolbox. We have regulations for noise sources on the EU level, and those can also be complemented with national policy. Then there are instruments that can be used in planning and abating noise in exposed areas. It can be noise regulations in national planning policies and also regulations in environmental permits for activities or industries that emit noise. And finally, to know where to make measures and to evaluate if measures have taken have, an, have had an effect, there is the noise mapping and the following action plans. And if you work with these tools, the result should be in a reduction in the number of exposed people exposed to noise. And as such, following a reduction of the negative health effects, uh, which leads to lower costs for society, but also, of course, a possibility of higher quality of life for those affected. Change slide, please. As I said, the END consists of one part that is the noise mapping and one part that is the action plans. And you can boil that down to finding the answer to questions. How big is the problem and what should we do about it? The noise maps seem to get uh, often get attention in media. The cities like to go out and present the noise maps when they are finished, and some cities are also making them available on the city website. The action plan usually doesn't get the same attention, but in fact, it's the action plan that in many ways can be considered to be more important, because that there is where you decide what to do to actually reduce the noise. 
The future no noise exposure is very much depending on the ambition level of the action plan. And with, which I will talk about a bit later, the END doesn't really say anything about what you should do to reduce environmental noise or what actions that should be taken, only that you should have an action plan. And then it is up to the parties responsible to fill the action plan with effective me measures. Next slide. Uh, and here's a flow chart that shows the different parts of the END taken by, from a report by the European Environmental Agency about noise in Europe. It's a very good report to read if you are interested in these questions. Uh, and I think Charlotte also showed the same picture earlier today. Uh, here you can see the flow chart uh, and what that should be done according to the END. In the first years, which sources that should be mapped, the major roads, the major railways, airports, and the agglomerations. And what steps that needs to be taken. You need to collect the data, you need to do a noise modeling and validation of that model, and you need to determine the population and building exposure. After that, you should report the results from the noise mapping uh, as uh, noise contours and also tables with of how many people that are exposed in different uh, sound level intervals. And after that is the next step of developing the action plan where you need to identify where do we have the hotspots, where do we have the most exposed, do we have areas of other kinds that needs to be uh, uh, treated in some kind. We have schools and preschool yards, you have recreational areas, etc. Uh, and this process will repeat itself. So when you are finished with the noise mapping, you will do the action plan. And when the action plan is done, you can start working with the next round of noise mapping. And you might also... Uh, yeah, you can change slide here, please. The first step that should be taken even before beginning working with the END is to decide which parties on what levels that should be responsible for different activities. And here you need to look at how the nation with its entities, regions and cities are organized. How is the responsibility best distributed among the stakeholders? You might also want to consider if the result of the noise mapping can have other uses. If you're doing these large scale calculations, can you, for example, use them in planning purposes as well? Synergies with other uses will make the work more efficient. And you also need to think if you are already doing parts that is required for the END. For example, if you have a program for noise abatement around the, the major roads already. Next slide. The things you need to consider when organizing the work in the END is who holds the data necessary for doing noise mapping, like the information on traffic intensity on the roads, uh, and who holds maps and GIS data with buildings and terrain. And these are parties that you need to involve early in the process to do the noise mapping. And then there is the question on who has use of the result. Noise mapping is a large problem project and as I said it can be gained by using the results for more than just reporting to the EU. Noise mapping over a city can be used for planning for example. For the action plan it is also of utmost importance to think through which stakeholders have the legal and factual right to do a certain measure. Some measures can be done by national or city administrations but for others you need to cooperate with private companies or private homeowners. And finally, you should also consider how to share the knowledge among the parties working with the END in one way or another. Especially since this is a project that returns every five years, it is important to gather experience and to improve the work going on to the next phase, making it easier and getting results with higher quality. For this, you will probably want to have some kind of cooperation between national and the local administrations and also with acquisitions and other experts in, for example, environmental medicine. Next slide. As an example, I have tried to summarize how the responsibilities for the END is distributed in Sweden. On the national level, we have the Environmental Protection Agency, where, where I work, 
Uh, and we have the responsibility to collect the results from noise mapping and the action plans and then reporting them to the EU. And we also share a national network where the parties involved in the END meet and share knowledge and information on a regular basis. And we are also taking part in the EU working groups uh, concerning the END. Then also on the national level, we have the National Transport Administration, and they own and manage national roads and railroads and are responsible for noise, noise mapping and action plans for those. And together with the National Airport Company, they also produce noise maps and action plans for the major airports. On the regional level, we have one public transport company with railway lines, lines that exceeds 30,000 trains per year. So they are also included in the END work. And then there are the municipalities with more than 100,000 inhabitants. And that is what we count as an agglomeration uh, in the END directive. A city, as it is perceived, can consist of several municipalities. And this leads to that the noise map can be a bit well, at least perceived as incomplete. If we look at the capital area of Stockholm, it consists of more than 10 different municipalities. And only two of them had more than 100,000 inhabitants and were had in the latest round of noise mapping. So there are gaps in the noise maps if you look at the Stockholm area. And here you might argue that it could have been a better representation if we had, had a different definition of agglomeration. But on the other hand, it comes back to who has the factual and legal rights to do noise measures. And that lies very heavily on the municipalities. And getting several municipalities to agree on how to prioritize and finance uh, noise reducing measures would probably not have been very effective. But that is a decision you have to make when you are organizing the work in the END. Next slide. When you have pinpointed who are the responsible parties, those parties need to start organizing the noise mapping itself. And to do this, you need to have an understanding of what is needed for large scale noise calculations. The EU have decided on what, which calculation models to use. It is called CNOSOS, and they have modules for road, rail, industry, and aircraft noise. This image shows uh, primarily the data needed for road noise calculations. And to begin with, you need the data on the sources, that is the roads themselves. You need the geographic data of the roads, where they go with their location and their height in some kind of digital format. And you also need to know how many vehicles per day or per year that passes on the road and how they are dis distributed during the day, evening and night, so you can calculate the LVM uh, value. You also need to know uh, the distribution of different vehicle types, how many cars and trucks and buses that go on the road. And you need to know the speed of the road, which most often we use the speed limit. And finally, you can also need some knowledge of what type of road it is, uh, what is the road surface and how many lanes there are. And in some cases, this it could be good to have very detailed data about these. Uh, but in other cases, you can probably do assumptions and uh, estimations. Then, since it takes time to do measurement of traffic flows, it is important to start the inventory of existing data early. So you need to do, know if you need to do new measurements of traffic flows before starting the noise mapping. And for the calculations, you also need geographical data on the environment. You need the terrain heights, you need information on ground types, buildings, and noise screens. There, that is the major parts of doing noise calculations. You might also want to add vegetation, uh, but it's not necessary because the damping effect of vegetation is not as high as many might think. And finally, there is the weather. Uh, sound propagation is greatly affected by weather. Uh, but in these types of calculation, we almost always use a pre-decided standard weather to simplify the calculation and to make it possible to reproduce them. And since the noise indicator LDN is a year average value, the temporal difference in noise level due to that weather is evened out. 
So you don't need specific uh, local weather data for doing this calculation, but you can use a more broader scale weather data. And finally, for calculating the numbers of exposed, you need population data in, in some kind. And having gathered all this data, what you do then, or what a consultant will do, is to build a geographical model in a computer and start with the calculations. And the result will be contour lines, like in the image on the top right, where you can see the colored areas uh, with around uh, the traffic, the roads with traffic, and where each colored area corresponds to five decibel intervals. And you can also get the num tables with numbers of exposed inhabitants in different sound level intervals, like the table in the lower right. Next slide. When you gather the data, you need to take time to ensure that the quality of the coverage is as good as you like, because that will greatly affect the results. If there are gaps in the geographical data, you need to have time to fill those gaps before the noise mapping starts. And as I said, some data you can uh, use assumptions and uh, estimations instead of specific data on the local site. Uh, but uh, where there are others, other data that you that you really want to have a quite a good quality with, without the end result being too badly affected. And the EU have published a good practice guide for noise mapping that covers quite a lot of how you should think about the quality of data and which assumptions that are uh, possible to use to simplify this process. Uh, noise screens is a very important uh, data to include in the calculations since they are often placed in the areas with the highest exposure. And not adding them will exaggerate the numbers of exposed and adding them but overestimating their effect will underestimate the numbers of exposed. And it's our experience in Sweden that noise screens are, are not always included in the geographical maps that we use for noise calculations. And if they are, they're often just included as a line and there are no information on the height of the screen. So in many cases, the noise screens had to be visually inspected, which takes quite a lot of time. And for population data, uh, in some parts you might have the population data linked to certain buildings. And that is of course a very good quality of data. But in other areas, you might have the population in a larger area and you want to use the distribution with number of people per square kilometers, or you might want to distribute it based on the building size. There are different ways to go here, depending on what uh, the level of detail of the data that you have available. Next slide. For railroad, the sound sources differ a bit from road noise. The noise emission from different kinds of road vehicles are included in the calculation models. But for train models, that database of vehicles is not ex as extensive as it is for road vehicles. And you might have national train types that are missing in the databases. So before starting noise calculations, you need to do an inventory of the more common train types in your area and see if there are types that need to be measured before starting the noise mapping. And for trains, there are several sound sources as each, at each train, which corresponds to the engine, uh, the connection between the rail and the wheels, the brakes, and also aerodynamic noise from the rail body, the, the, the train body itself. And you need to measure each train at different speeds. So it takes quite a lot of work to decide the noise emission of a train. So this is something that you also need to start with early. For railroad noise calculations, you need to know the geographical data, of course, and the speed limits, just like for, for roads. But you also need to know uh, about rail roughness, uh, the maintenance of the rails, and also if there are bridges and switches, because they will greatly affect the noise emission. Otherwise, you, there is more or less the same data needed as for road uh, noise calculations. Next slide. Uh, for airports, uh, the data gathering is often a more simpler task than for road, uh, road and railroad because the traffic to major airports are usually well documented 
uh, and near the airports that aircraft follows certain tracks, making it fairly easy to distribute the annual traffic on the runways and the tracks for the specific airports. And then there are also international databases with noise emission data for common aircraft that can be used for noise mapping. So what you often do is that you group, uh, if you have 10 aircrafts with a similar noise emission, you group them and you put the same noise, noise emission on, on all of them. And then you use that as data for, for the calculations. Uh, so that is often a, a simpler and, and a simpler project than doing road and rail calculations. Um, next slide. And finally, we have the noise from major industries, which should be included in the noise map for agglomerations. And in industries, it can also be ports and harbors. Um, and industries are the most diverse of the major sound sources. Uh, it's easy to say that every industry has a unique noise emission. So it's not realistic to do detailed noise emission measurements for all industries within a city. So what you can do instead is to look at noise regulations in general and also the environmental permits that the industries hold and assume that all industries emit as much noise as they are allowed to do. Uh, it could be of interest to know if a certain industry has working hours or time restrictions that prohibits them from working at night since the nighttime level is uh, quite heavily affects the LDM. Uh, but otherwise it's probably easiest to use some kind of estimations uh, for the industrial noise because as I said, making measurements at each site is, is not a realistic task to do. Next slide. And this is just a short summary of what I've said about data gathering. Uh, it's important to put time and effort in doing this phase because it will greatly affect the outcome of the noise mapping and the quality of the noise mapping and what you can use the noise maps for in, in later stages. And probably you will start doing this the first round and you will learn a lot and then you will start improving it to the next round, et cetera, because this is, this is definitely a work in progress. Uh, and uh, you will learn as, as you are doing it what, what data you have and where you need to, to make um, put efforts to, to improve the data and, and uh, et cetera. But it will take time. Um, next slide. Uh, when the data is available, the next phase is the actual calculations of noise. I will not say as, so much about that because the calculations are uh, most often made with commercial software. Uh, there are a couple of those available on the market and the large softwares have been adapted for E&D noise mapping. Uh, they have certain modules that will simplify noise calculations for large areas. And it is my recommendation here that the noise calculations are done by consultants or other parties that have experience with working with noise calculations. Uh, you should know that the calculations require quite a lot of computer power. It's probably best to do them on a dedicated server or a network of computers. And if consultants are doing the calculations, it is important to think through the contract with the consultants. And that is a typical area where the cities doing noise mapping could benefit. I want to stress again on the importance on that data gathering and the quality of control of data. Uh, also to think if the noise map have other uses. Um, and before starting the noise map, map mapping a whole agglomeration or a large sections of roads for the first time, I also strongly recommend that you do test runs for smaller areas just to see how the process are going and where the problems might arise. Uh, to, Improve the quality of the results, you might also want to do control me measurements in certain places to validate the model. And while you're doing the noise mapping, also try to document the process as best as you can and try to learn as much as you can to simplify the next round. Next slide. 
Um, now I just want to talk a bit about the action plans where the actual work is being done. As I said earlier, the END doesn't specify what actions you should take to reduce noise exposure, but it does say what an action plan should include. And it gives a framework for the process of developing an action plan. And that is the points on this slide and also the next slide, uh, where it says that the action plan should have a description of the agglomeration or the road or what it is that it's describing. Uh, description of authorities, and if you have limit values, uh, a summary of the results of the noise mapping, etc. And it also should include a record of public consultation, but it's because that is a part of uh, developing a noise uh, action plan is that the public should in some kind be consulted and be able to come with input to what the action plan should include. Next slide. This is just a continuing on what the, the END says about the framework for the action plan. Uh, the, there should be a description of the measures that are already being taken and the ones that you are planning. Uh, it, should, it should include financial information, some budgets and cost effectiveness, cost benefit assessments, etc. cetera. Uh, and it should also contain estimations in terms of the reduction of number of people affected so that you can follow up and see, do you, did this action really get the result that we wanted? Next slide. Uh, you have rather free hands to form the actions you find suitable for your area, uh, but the actions that could be considered are actions uh, concerning traffic, traffic planning, like can we reduce the speed limit on a section of a road to reduce noise? Can we have some kind of regulations like forbidding uh, uh, nighttime traffic in a certain area, for example? Uh, of course, the planning of new roads and planning of new residential areas is an important uh, part. You can have technical measures at the sound sources like changing road surfaces or uh, noise abatement at industries. Uh, selection of quieter sources uh, like um, buying um, buses that go on electricity instead of, of uh, fuel will reduce noise in city areas. You can have actions uh, which is the reduction of sound transmission for noise screens, for example, and also vegetation in some kind. But as I said, vegetation doesn't really give as much result as you might want to, but there are often other benefits with vegetations, uh, so which you can add to noise reduction, so they can all, anyway be a, a good measure to, uh, to do. And then you can have reg some kind of um, incentives for, for example, for homeowners to change windows uh, or other kind of incentives to, to make other parties do measures to reduce noise. Next slide. I have uh, an example from one of the cities in Sweden that is included in the END. It's a city of Umeå. It's a town in the northern Sweden, the pretty town, uh, famous for its many birch trees. Umeå has about 130,000 inhabitants. It's a growing city. It has a university and a big hospital and an airport rather close to town. And there are major roads and railways near the city. And there are also industrial areas near to the city. And the noise mapping shows that about 40,000 of the inhabitants are exposed to road and rail noise, noise over 55 dBE, dBA LDN. Next slide. This slide just shows you the noise map of Umeå, where you can clearly see the major roads going through the, the city. Uh, this is also a map that is available on the city website, so you can zoom in and look at your street and see what noise levels you are exposed to if you want to. And on the city website, you can also find the action plan, which you can see uh, at the right, and that is an action plan that has been approved by the City Council, and it uh, covers the period from 2019 to 2023. Next slide. 
The action plan of Umeå consists of actions targeting 11 different areas. Uh, most actions are to reduce noise in and near dwellings, but there are also actions to reduce noise at schools and preschools and to improve sound quality in parks and recreational areas. Some actions are focused on doing specific abatement measures like building noise screens, while others are more strategical, like the one about increasing sustainable travel. Next slide. All actions are described in detail in a table, and this is one example from that table uh, about reducing noise in schoolyards. And here you can see that the, in this table you describe the action, what they want to do, uh, what benefits that will be gained, what resources are needed, both in staff and money, what part of the city administration that is responsible, and a timetable for when the action should be finished. And this kind of presentation makes it very clear what the city aims to do, and it makes it also rather easy to evaluate how the action is progressing, if they will finish in time, uh, and what it will cost. Next slide. This is another part of the action plan that I thought I would show you. It's about parks and recreation areas. And here the city have used the noise map to identify which parks that are exposed to noise. And they have put up a local guideline value as a criteria saying that a park is noise exposed if it has more than 55 dBA at more than half of the area of the park. And so the red areas in this map are the parks that doesn't fulfill that guideline value. And that is the areas there that the city will prioritize measures to reduce noise. And you can also use this kind of presentation to highlight where the areas with, that already have a good soundscape and then take measures to preserve those areas and make them more accessible to the public. That is another kind of action that you might want to do for recreations and parks. And next slide. The last action I want to lift as an example is programs with financial incentives for home and real estate owners to improve sound insulation of windows. In almost every home, uh, the windows are the weak spot when it comes to sound insulation and improving the windows will have a significant positive effect for noise level indoors, reducing the risk of negative health effects. Often you can improve the sound insulation of existing windows by adding extra glazing so you don't need to change the whole window. Depending on the condition of the window, the extra glazing can reduce noise indoors with up to 10 dB. So it's, you can get quite a lot of improvement with a fairly simple uh, measure. And this action is done uh, by the city deciding which homeowners should receive financial aid for improving sound insulation. Usually they target those with the highest noise exposure. The work of improving the windows is done by the homeowner himself or by a contractor that the homeowner hire, and then they get uh, some kind of financial aid from the city. You should, of course, have some kind of control that the action has been done correctly by visual inspection or a measurement. Uh, but if it's done okay, the city will pay most of the cost for extra glazing. And exactly how much, if it's like 75% or 90%, you can decide for each city. And you should also be aware that improved sound insulation by extra glazing of this kind will also have positive effects on energy consumption. So it's a bonus for these kinds of action. And this is a typical action where you, that it's outside the city's uh, factual and legal right to do something at the buildings, but then they can use other incentives to make homeowners do something about the buildings. So uh, finally, my last slide, I'm just going to mention something uh, thank you, about health costs. Uh, in the next round of noise mapping, according to the END, the member states should report not only how many are exposed to noise, but also the cost of the following health effects. And formulas for cal calculating health effects are based on the studies presented by the WHO guidelines for the European region, which came in 2018, which also Charlotte mentioned. Uh, the detail concerning these calculations has not been completely set, as far as I'm aware, uh, and there are still some ongoing discussions. 
uh, but it's well, it could be interesting to know that 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 kind of calculations will be added to the END. Uh, and that is all I had to present. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, and so we move on to the next part of the workshop. Thank you. Oh, Lisa. No. Thank you, Lisa, for your interesting, very interesting presentation. I will immediately move to the next section of our agenda, these being panel discussions where we have posted many questions already. Some of these questions I myself prepared, and I believe that this will be beneficial for all of us to clearly understand this matter and for better strategic planning when it comes to the issue of noise. I will start from the issue that and question that has been received first in our Q&A section. It relates to religious facilities. Uh, participant is interested to hear whether there are any researchers that of the uh, topic of noise coming from religious facilities, religious buildings, so mosques and churches, which at certain parts of the day uh, produce a sound to inform believers uh, about prayer time. So this and about the noise from uh, catering facilities in residential areas. So the question relates to religious facilities and uh, coffee bars in a city and residential areas. We can start uh, with Lisa to try to respond to this question. I'm not aware of any studies uh, about uh, actual health effects from this kind of, of uh, noise sources. I don't know if Charlotte might have more information on that. Um, in what I do know, in, in Sweden, we have some it's not a general um, not general regulations but in, in some cases there have been local regulations that that other either to reduce the noise level or just to to have them at specific times so it's it's okay to to uh, have uh, church bells or or um, mosques um, uh, sounding at the, during daytime but not during nighttime for example i know there are, are church bells that have had to lower their, their noise uh, from the bells during night, for example. So, so that kind of, of uh, regulations, but not in general. I'm not sure if Charlotte or Victor would like to say something, whether they have had some experiences in regards to this question. If not, we can move to the next question. This question concerns also the noise from catering facilities, from bars, etc. Uh, this is for the reason that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the issue of noise is mostly percepted as a noise from religious facilities. So our question uh, is related that these catering facilities are usually opened in the uh, uh, residential buildings, in the ground floors, do you, and they create noise. So do you have any examples from your respective countries? How is this dealt with? Perhaps the question for Lisa or Victor, if you can say something. Yes, for for uh, like restaurants and bars and, and such, uh, we have uh, usually they they don't they are not allowed to serve alcohol too late at night. That is what was what they also most often use to to make the the bar close at a certain uh, hour. And then we also have. Um, uh, national guideline values for noise indoors. So if you have an activity, it doesn't really matter what kind of activity it is, but if you that activity creates too loud noise indoors with closed windows, etc., uh, then you need to do some kind of, of uh, reducing measures, which is most often that they have to close at a certain time, uh, most often at 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, 
that you you don't you you can't have too loud activities uh, after that hours in in residential areas. Uh, uh, regarding this question in Romania, we have a uh, uh, limit to railway 50 decibels outdoor and uh, 25 uh, decibels uh, indoor. And uh, this type of um, uh, uh, regulation uh, uh, are, uh, are uh, uh, in a field of control of the city force. Uh, we have also in Romania a problem with uh, catering or restaurants which are in the uh, in the buildings, uh, residential buildings at the at the, uh, at the, at the uh, but uh, but uh, we have this uh, legislation and city calls need to to uh, make uh, the, uh, this type of control when uh, uh, population. Uh, have uh, re reclam uh, reclamations. Uh, I understood the, the question is also for uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, some uh, religious facilities or or only for restaurants and catering. Okay, uh, yeah, regarding. Uh, 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 religion facilities, we don't have any uh, regulation from us. Very well, I would like to move to the next question. We have two questions, in fact, that are similar. According to the action plans, who is authorized to implement recovery measures when it comes to transport, industry, airports, and railways? And how can you ensure uh, these means? And the other question is similar. After uh, the law is adopted in a country, whether changes, amendments to the roads construction are permitted uh, so changes to the existing infrastructure, is it allowed? I hope that these questions were clear. We can start from Lisa again, if she'd like to say something. Who implements recovery measures and how are the funds uh, uh, obtained, provided? Uh, Yes, well, that, that is where you come back to if a if, uh, party has the, the factual and legal rights to do measures. And uh, I would guess that it is quite similar in different countries. You have a certain party that is the, the responsible for the noise source itself, the, the road owner or the railway owner, which could be a national administration or a regional administration or a local uh, municipality. And uh, therefore the actions should be at that party. So if, for, for example, if the National Road Administration uh, are the ones that owns and man maintains the roads, they are also the ones that should do the action plans, do the noise mapping and uh, should uh, do the noise measures and fund the noise measures. Uh, so the, the, it's a polluter pay principle that, that uh, the ones that are responsible for the noise are the ones that should do the actions. And therefore it could be difficult, for example, if when, when it's a city or agglomeration doing noise maps and action plans, they, they can't really, well, they, they can have some limited um, of availability to industries, for example. So they, they, the, the city can't go up to an industry and build a noise screen, uh, but they have, so they have to work with other kinds of measures like financial incentives or, or other kind of regulations uh, to do that kind of measure. So you really need to see how the, the responsibility for the noise source itself uh, are how they are distributed within, within the country. 
but for the main noise sources, which is the, the infrastructure, uh, it's usually the one that owns and maintains the road or railway that, that will do the noise measure, the noise uh, reduction measures themselves. And uh, as for the question about doing changes, that is of course possible. Uh, and then it is um, of course good to have some kind of uh, national or regional regulation on what kind of noise levels should you aim for when you do changes. You can often have a bit higher ambition level when you're doing actual changes in the infrastructure, rather when you just have the, the same conditions that has been for 50, 100 years. Uh, so when you're rebuilding a road or building a new road, uh, you can use the, that possibility to also build noise screens and, and do improvements on, on buildings around the road, etc. Perhaps it would be interesting to hear from Victor in Romania who covers the costs of recovery of improvements or some other infrastructural uh, uh, undertakings that have been uh, uh, included in the action plan. Like you, like I say in my presentation, uh, we in the past needed to solve some gaps. When I present in my slides uh, some uh, uh, governmental decision which we made in 2020, in 2008, in 2016, uh, these gaps uh, was improved because, uh, uh, like I mentioned in my presentation, in 2005, when we ensured the first uh, transposition of N, we uh, 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 didn't identify very well uh, the authorities which are responsible uh, to, to make noise map, to make action plan and to put in an application uh, uh, noise uh, abandonment measurements which are in the uh, action plans. Uh, and for this reason, for example, in 2007, when we make uh, first uh, round of noise mapping, uh, our city halls made noise map action plan for all noise sources. But after that, we changed this approach and we put uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the authority which have uh, 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 in administration the noise sources to, put, to make noise map action plan and to put in application a noise abutment measure. For example, uh, our uh, national road company if uh, have the responsibility to make noise map action plan and to put in application noise measurement abandonment uh, for uh, for all uh, all uh, uh, major roads which are in uh, administration of this company if we we have major roads which are in administration for example city calls or uh, uh, or uh, other uh, uh, local authorities, this authority have the responsibility to make noise map action plan and to put in application noise reduction measures. This is the approach. You cannot put uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to make uh, this uh, noise reduction to put uh, to other authorities. You need to put to the owner of the noise sources. We have made this mistake in 2005 before we uh, uh, become member state. And in 2007, when we made the first noise maps, we didn't prepare for this job for this reason. Yes. And we changed all the legislation step by step in order to harmonize uh, all these gaps to, 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 to solve, not to harmonize, to solve all these gaps. Uh, uh, and in our country, uh, uh, our uh, authorities which make noise maps, action plan, and put in application uh, uh, noise uh, reduction uh, uh, measures are uh, uh, the authorities which have in uh, administration the noise source. This is the, be uh, the better approach. Other approach, it is, uh, it is a better approach. But I don't understand the second question. The second question, I don't understand. 
Tiče se... Ne, ovaj, ništa, samo tiče se ovaj, ko snosi troškove saniranja buke. Mislim da ste to već... Dobro... Concerns the question who is uh, paying for the measures to reduce noise. That was the point and I just wanted to confirm this. You already answered this question. Oh, okay. Now we can continue. One question which has been frequently asked in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, which may be a problem in future. And it is in relation uh, with illegally constructed facilities with, uh, uh, in the vicinity of uh, the source of noise. Mod modeling did not recommend the construction of residential facility in that area. And very often they do build uh, buildings, but then they complain about the noise. This has been a very often uh, phenomenon in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I don't know whether you had such situations in Romania or elsewhere, Victor. Were there any cases that uh, uh, there uh, were some illegally constructed residential buildings in the vicinity of uh, the source of noise, and then the inhabitants would later on complain and claim their rights uh, from the authorities? Do you understand the question? Yes, okay. In Romania, we had in the past, uh, and we have also now some uh, of this uh, problem, uh, but uh, in the new legislation uh, in 2019, we put uh, the obligation for the city hall to, uh, to take in consideration uh, the noise maps and uh, noise limit uh, in uh, uh, when they develop the uh, the ur urban uh, urbanization of the city. And uh, because they, they now uh, have this obligation, uh, usually they uh, didn't uh, uh, have uh, uh, the permit to, to, to make some residential building in the locations uh, which are uh, with uh, with uh, noise uh, problem uh, due to tra noise uh, road traffic or air traffic uh, but also uh, in, uh, in romania we are in the beginning of this uh, process but we we put in our legislation and we uh, uh, we um, find a solution in order to 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 uh, to solve this problem. Thank you. Let's move to the next question. We have received multiple questions and I don't know if we will be able to answer all of them uh, within the time we are given, but uh, if that's not the case, uh, we will respond in writing. Uh, the question, uh, do you have any sanctions, penalties, and uh, what is the amount of these sanctions uh, for violations of noise limitations during the day? For instance, uh, from railroad, ra railways or industry, if you have prescribed uh, threshold limit values. Just uh, please explain what is the penalty regime. Perhaps, uh, Lisa, if you could uh, share with us your experience first. Sorry, my, my, my mobile is a bit Did you slow. hear the Yes, I, I heard the question. I heard the question. I just couldn't put the sound on. Um, uh, we in Sweden, at least, we don't have any uh, penalties uh, like uh, fines or something if you if you exceed the threshold values. Uh, what what can happen is that you will have to finance some kind of measures to reduce the noise, and that is can of course be very expensive or it can be rather cheap depending on the situations but we don't have any any standardized fines for for exceeding the values 
we have in Sweden, we don't have, uh, we don't use limit values as much uh, as guideline values, which means that they can often be exceeded a bit without it having to, to uh, without you having to do anything. Uh, so it's a bit of a rubber band value uh, that we're using. That's very interesting. Victor, yes, in Romania, what's your experience? Which we have treasured values and uh, the, 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 the responsibility of the authorities to, to find some solution in order to reduce the noise. We don't uh, have penalty. But also we have, um, uh, now we work on the new, uh, new legislation for noise limits and uh, noise uh, uh, threshold values and uh, uh, we have we we'll, maybe we will have some uh, some approach regarding to use uh, noise limits only when uh, the others uh, the don't exist solution in order to reduce noise and uh, uh, we will use uh, this noise limit in order to to uh, or only for indoor, or only to assure uh, the noise limits uh, uh, inside the, the, the residential, uh, inside the dreaming. But for outside, uh, we used fair short values and uh, not fair penalties. We uh, make uh, the obligation in the law for, for the administration of the noise source to find the solution in order to reduce the noise. And perhaps uh, one related question is uh, related to monitoring. How do you monitor noise uh, in accordance with the action plan and uh, how good is the implementation of the action plan and who is responsible for monitoring of noise and who is funding the monitoring of noise? Uh, perhaps Lisa or Victor again, what are your experience? Um, well, we have, uh, it's the same, the same, party that is doing the noise mapping and doing the action plans that are also responsible for following up uh, the results mm -hmm. of the action plans. So we don't have a, a, a different administration or something that monitors and, and follows up the noise. Uh, so it's done by themselves. Yes. Uh... You have, we have Romania, how do you carry out monitoring once a year or on a monthly basis or so perhaps victor you can uh, you yes, can explain uh, this on your example uh, we have uh, okay uh, the noise source administration uh, the authority which uh, have in administration the noise source have the obligation to put in application the action plan but we have uh, 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 some responsibility for our environmental agency in order to see if the noise uh, reduction measures which are put uh, in, in this action plan uh, are put in application. And if uh, are not put in application, uh, we need uh, 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 to uh, the the local authority, for example, need to to put in the uh, future action plan uh, the reason why they don't put in application the, the, the uh, noise reduction measure which was established in the in the past and uh, uh, how, which deadline uh, uh, they will have in order to put in application this noise uh, reduction measure. Uh, our uh, local agency have this responsibility to, to, to monitoring uh, which, uh, which uh, noise reduction measures are put in application uh, and which are not put in application, which are, was mentioned in the action plan. Uh, 
Hvala na odgovoru. Evo. Thank you very much for your answer. And now we come to the end of uh, our webinar. I would kindly ask you to stay with us for other 10 minutes to answer, to try to answer some questions. These uh, uh, answers are very crucial for us because uh, we are at the beginning in a very early phase uh, of our efforts to transpose the directive. So your experience is crucial. We had several questions. I will sum them up. Charlotte referred repeatedly in her uh, presentation, previously conducted studies uh, on effects of noise in educational facilities uh, on the health of children and people employed there. Uh, Charlotte referred to this, but uh, it would perhaps be interesting to hear what are the measures, the common measures you apply in these educational facilities uh, which help uh, uh, pr uh, protecting the health of children. Yes, maybe I can start. Uh, I guess there are many things that you can do to protect the children from uh, uh, excessive uh, noise levels. I guess you can um, see that there are exposure from the outside, from the traffic or uh, industrial plants or other activities coming from the outside. And then, of course, it is important to uh, in have proper insulation of the buildings and uh, uh, good windows, etc. that we have talked about. And if possible, at least parts of the schoolyard should also be shielded uh, from excessive noise uh, to ensure that uh, the children can play outside and uh, get uh, enough uh, restoration and uh, physical activity that they need to perform in the schools. Um, there are also sounds from the activities going on within uh, the, the school. Uh, and there you can work with the, the acoustics in the room and um, yeah, reduce noise from any types of equipment and place some um, yeah, other materials on tables and chairs, for example, to reduce the overall noise, both from the children and the activities themselves and also from, from the outside. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, answer. Very interesting. As a very interesting e example, how we can protect our children in school. Now I scrolled through these questions uh, to see if uh, there are some more interesting questions. Question from Amar. I will try to uh, translated how close does the institute karolinskaya uh, work with the government on the issue of negative impact of noise on health and do they have any advisory role and is the government funding research activities that will help them to better understand the adverse effects of noise on health? That was the question for Charlotte. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, the Karolinska Institute is uh, both a traditional research institution uh, with different research areas um, uh, covered, uh, but we are also, at least the institute where I work, the Institute of Environmental Medicine, we are also a national agency for environmental uh, and health issues. Uh, so in that sense, we are kind of advisory board um, to different agencies uh, and uh, uh, public in many aspects. And we do uh, get involved in a lot of um, uh, assignments uh, um, regarding health risk assessments uh, on noise. So we're often interacting with uh, the uh, national agencies and other authorities in these uh, matters and try to advise uh, what are the best uh, ways to avoid uh, 
uh, impacts on public health from, from noise exposure. So we have a lot of um, exchange, both uh, nationally and uh, regionally within Sweden, and also with regards to EU and WHO. Yes. Uh, I will use uh, uh, an opportunity to ask for uh, ask another question, which pertains to uh, judicial proceedings. Are uh, have there been any judicial proceedings uh, launched uh, based on allegations on? of the effect of noise by a group of citizens or uh, who complained uh, that their health deteriorated as a result of exposure to noise. I don't know who can answer this question, whoever, perhaps Lisa for the start and then Victor, if you have some examples to share. Yes, uh, we have uh, quite a lot of um, examples where people have complained about, no about noise and taking it to environmental court and wanting to have some kind of measures uh, being made. And it's, we have examples for, from all kinds of noise sources, uh, road, rail, and industrial, and uh, uh, football, soccer plants, and uh, aircraft, airports, and almost anything you might think of. Um, and uh, we have quite a worked out um, uh, legal preferences for, for, for when they when they can have measures done or, or not. Uh, so that is quite well worked out in the in the legal system. Uh, one Example, which I think is very interesting, uh, is uh, concerning aircraft noise around uh, Arlanda, which is the biggest airport in Sweden. When they uh, wanted a new environmental permit, there is, was this um, organization of neighbors in the surrounding areas that went together and demanded that uh, the the uh, the project that the airport wanted to do that, that they didn't want it because it would be mean too much noise uh, where they lived. But if the project were to get the environmental permit, uh, they wanted funding to be put aside for research concerning uh, aircraft noise. So there is actually a research center at one of the technical universities in Stockholm um, doing funding research about aircraft noise. Uh, due to this environmental process. Uh, and that is, I think it's an interesting way to go uh, where you realize, well, well you, you, need to, you need to do this change, you need this infrastructure, but we can also use the environmental pr process to get funding for, for new research and knowing more about uh, the effects that this, this kind of noise will have. Uh, so it's all, everything from, from that rather large scale down to the single homeowner wanting a noise screen outside uh, the garden. So it's quite common. Yes. Also in, uh, in Romania, we have a lot of compliance about uh, regarding noise. Uh, from the restaurant activities for uh, road to traffic, railway traffic, airports. Um, uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the major uh, noise sources, uh, our approach is to solve this compliance uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, when uh, the, the authorities make the action plans. Uh, in order to find a solution, uh, 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 to solve uh, this compliance, because also these uh, action plans are uh, uh, need to put uh, uh, to public consultation, and, pub and public can uh, uh, participate to this uh, uh, to, to, uh, to this uh, to make uh, to the process of the make of, of action plans, and uh, then compliance uh, are uh, taken into account. 
regarding the other type of noise sources like uh, restaurants or other uh, small activities. Uh, this type of uh, our approach is to, to um, put uh, this, uh, the, the, the economic operator uh, uh, to make, uh, to find solution in order to, to solve the problem. And usually, city halls uh, have this task in Romania. Thank you very much indeed for these detailed answers. And now I would like to end this uh, question and answer session, but there are still some questions that remain unanswered. We will try to answer them in writing. May I now thank all the presenters uh, for their excellent presentations. I see in uh, our chat box that the participants are extremely happy with uh, today's webinar and that they find, found it uh, useful. I should only say now that uh, in late this month, we will have the third round of the meetings of the working groups and uh, uh, members of the institutions and consultancies uh, are also encouraged to participate uh, in the these working groups. And as we all see, there will be a lot of things that had have to be done by, both by the institutions and the consultancies. So the conclusions of this webinar will be very useful to this end. Uh, now, uh, I thank you all very much. And uh, I hope that we will have, be, we will be able to have similar webinars within this project. Thank you very much all and have a nice day. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.